Welcome to the New Institute series on Discovering Servant Leadership. So far in the series, we've provided a biblical framework for a life of Christian leadership and looked at faith, love, and service as the foundation for that life. We examined the power model of leadership, which Jesus rejected, and the service model, which includes the teachings of Jesus. We reviewed the characteristics of servant leadership and the key practices of servant leaders. We looked at organizational communities and institutional operating principles and talked about the challenge of leading change. In this lecture, we'll talk about human nature and human motivation. Our ability to lead and serve others uh, is affected by our assumptions about who people are and what motivates them. Often we just accept the assumptions that are common in the culture around us without really thinking about them. One person who thought about him was Douglas McGregor, a professor of management at MIT. In his classic book, The Human Side of Enterprise, McGregor said that how we lead and manage depends on our assumptions about human nature and human behavior. He grouped those assumptions into two sets that he called Theory X and Theory Y. Theory X says that people don't like work and will avoid it if at all possible. Because they don't like work, they have to be coerced, controlled, or threatened with punishment in order to get them to work. Most people want to avoid responsibility. They don't have much ambition. They just want to be secure. By contrast, Theory Y says work is as natural as play or rest. That you don't have to threaten people uh, to get them to work. In fact, people will exercise self-direction and self-control in working toward organizational objectives if they're committed to them. And they'll be committed to them if the rewards make sense to them. And those rewards can be psychological, like ego satisfaction or self-actualization. Theory Y also assumes that people will not only accept responsibility, they will seek it. Also, lots of people have the capacity to use their imagination, ingenuity, and creativity in solving organizational problems. In short, people are willing to work, and they have a lot to contribute to their organizations. McGregor said that, unfortunately, the intellectual potential of the average human being is only partially utilized at work. The reason is that Theory X managers won't let their employees contribute their best work. Then they blame their employees for not contributing their best. They blame poor performance on the employees. They say they're lazy, they're indifferent, uh, they're unwilling to accept responsibility, they're uncooperative, they're uncreative. It's all the employee's fault. Theory Y assumes that if employees are not contributing their best work, it's management's fault, not the employee's fault. People have a lot of potential. It's the manager's job to help them to realize that potential. That's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. And that's what servant leaders do. They help people to develop and utilize their full potential. You might call it Theory Y plus. That comes naturally, I think, to Christian leaders. We know that we are made in the image of God, and we each have certain talents or gifts that God has given us that we can use in loving and serving others. So helping people to develop those gifts is a sacred and noble task. It's a high priority for Christian servant leaders. In addition to assumptions like Theory X and Theory Y, leaders have assumptions about what motivates people. The two most common types of motivation are described as extrinsic and intrinsic. And let's, let's explore those ideas. Extrinsic motivation is about what you have to do, not what you want to do. So people who are extrinsically motivated may be doing a job they really don't like, but they're doing it because they need the money, the reward, or they need to avoid punishment. It's really that, that classic carrot and the stick idea. You know, this is, this is the idea about how you make a donkey move forward. You, you dangle the carrot in front of them so the donkey keeps leaning forward to try to get the carrot. That's the, the incentive, the, the intrinsic motivator, if you will. Uh, but you have this stick that you're ready to whap the, the donkey on the backside if he doesn't move forward. That's the threat of punishment. It's sort of a simple proposition, which is if you do this, you'll get that. But that has nothing to do with the work itself. The idea of extrinsic motivation is really ingrained in our culture and in our organizations. We use 
extrinsic motivation to try to raise our children and teach students and, and uh, get our employees to do their work. We'll, we'll tell uh, a child, you know, if you'll just read this book, uh, we'll give you ice cream. Um, if you get good grades, we'll throw a party for you. Uh, if you reach the sales quota, we'll give you a bonus. A lot of these practices are based on the research done 50 years ago by B.F. Skinner, a radical behaviorist. So the, the pigeons and rats in, in B.F. Skinner's experiments were conditioned by rewards and punishments. So Skinner concluded, well, that's the way to control people. Just offer them an incentive or issue a threat and people will do what you want them to do. However, people are not rats or pigeons. And empirical research over the last 30 years indicates that there are some important limitations to these extrinsic rewards and punishments. For his book, Punished by Rewards, Alfie Cohn read hundreds of studies about the effects of these extrinsic motivators, and he found that um, they did not result in people doing a better job. In fact, they can make things worse. One of the first things that happens when you use extrinsic motivators is that you devalue the work. You're saying the work is less important than the reward. For example, if you tell a child, if you'll just read this book, you can have ice cream, you're saying, well, reading the book's not very exciting, but the ice cream is. So it devalues the work or activity. Another thing that happens is that extrinsic rewards can kill intrinsic motivation. So something that was done for fun or because it was meaningful, uh, once you reward it, it becomes work, and then people won't continue to do it unless you give them more and more rewards. Alfie Cohn um, tells a, a joke uh, about that. Uh, it's a story about uh, an old man who knew something about how extrinsic rewards can kill intrinsic motivation. Uh, the story is that this gentleman sat on his porch and after school, a bunch of 10-year-old kids would come by and insult him, um, call him things like stupid and ugly and bald uh, every afternoon on their way home from school. Well, he didn't like that very much, so he came up with a plan. So the next time the school kids came by and were issuing all these insults, he went down to, on the lawn and he said to them, you know, if you'll come back and insult me again tomorrow, I'll give you each a dollar. Well, the kids were delighted. I mean, they had been doing this for free, and now they're going to get paid. I mean, this is terrific. This is exciting. So they came back the next day and hurled all kinds of insults. They were really enthusiastic. And the man was good to his word. He went down there and handed each of them a dollar. He said, if you come back tomorrow, I'll give you each 25 cents. Well, that wasn't as good as a dollar, but that was still pretty good. So the kids came back, and the next day they insulted him uproariously. And the man came down with a roll of, of, of quarters, and he handed each one a quarter. And he said, I'm sorry, from now on, I can only give you a penny for doing this. Well, the kids looked at each other in disbelief. Only a penny? Forget it. And they went away and were never seen again. The extrinsic reward had killed the intrinsic motivation. My wife, Dr. Elizabeth Keith, experienced the same effect when she was the advisor of the Japanese club at Tomasek Polytechnic in Singapore. This is a 400-member club, and every year they did a bunch of service projects on campus because it was fun. They just enjoyed doing it. Well, the campus administration decided they wanted to encourage more service projects, so what they would do is they would give clubs points for each of their service projects, and at the end of the year, the club with the most points would get a prize, like maybe a pizza party or something. Unfortunately, the result was the Japanese club did fewer service projects. The reason is that they would propose a project, and if the administration didn't offer them enough points, they wouldn't do it at all. So originally, they were doing all kinds of projects just for fun. Now they would only do them if a whole lot of points were offered. Cohen also found that rewards can hide problems. So when things aren't going well, managers are tempted to issue incentives or, or threats, uh, try, try to get people to, to do better without sitting down with their colleagues to find out why things aren't going well and how they might be improved. So in a sense, they're not managing. They're just issuing rewards or threats, and they still don't know why performance is poor. These rewards are hiding the problems. 
Empirical research shows that employees will set the goals at a low level, low enough that they are sure they can achieve the reward. There's also a sense of only doing the minimum amount necessary to get the reward, not one bit more. There's also a temptation to cut corners or even to cheat. An article a few years back in the Harvard Business Review described something that happened at Sears Roebuck. Sears decided that uh, they would give their auto mechanics uh, a new sales goal of $147 per hour. Well, one assumes that those who didn't achieve that goal, uh, that their jobs would be in jeopardy. In any event, what happened was the auto mechanics didn't work faster. They overcharged for their services and charged people for repairing things that weren't broken. Another example uh, is Wells Fargo Bank. Thousands of Wells Fargo employees uh, created an estimated three and a half million uh, accounts uh, without the consent of their customers. Um, their customers were being charged for accounts they didn't even know about. The bank employees did this to reach the sales quotas that the bank had set for them. One assumes that those who reached the quota got certain rewards, those who didn't uh, receive certain threats. Well, the fraud was eventually uncovered, and so far, Wells Fargo Bank has paid more than $600 million in settling lawsuits that arose from these fraudulent accounts. More recently, the company is running TV ads that acknowledge that they lost everyone's trust as a result of these fraudulent accounts, and now they're trying to reestablish the company in order to reestablish trust with their customers. So for Sears and Wells Fargo Bank, the extrinsic rewards backfired. We've been talking about extrinsic motivators. The other main source of motivation is called intrinsic, and it's very different from extrinsic because intrinsic motivators, they're about things that you want to do, not about things that you have to do. So people who are intrinsically motivated are doing something because it's fun, it's interesting, it's fulfilling, it's meaningful. The work itself is the reward. So we're not saying if you do this, you'll get that. We're saying if you do this, you'll like it. It'll be fun or interesting or meaningful or fulfilling. In his book, Intrinsic Motivation at Work, uh, Dr. Kenneth W. Thomas reported on 16 years of research he and his colleagues did on intrinsic motivation. What they found was that intrinsic motivation is related to higher levels of job satisfaction, performance, innovativeness, commitment to the organization, and reduced stress. They found that there were four major intrinsic rewards at work. A sense of meaningfulness, a sense of choice, a sense of competence, and a sense of progress. And those are intrinsic rewards that servant leaders pay attention to. They help their colleagues to find meaning in serving God by serving others. They unleash their colleagues so that they can make choices. They build competence by training and developing their colleagues and they mentor and coach to help their colleagues to experience progress in their work. One of the most read articles in the history of the Harvard Business Review was an article by Frederick Hertzberg, and the title was, One More Time, How Do You Motivate Employees? In this article, Hertzberg talked about intrinsic and extrinsic factors. He said they were both important, but they're different. Hertzberg believed that there are extrinsic factors that lead to extreme dissatisfaction at work. And those include company policy and administration, relationship with a supervisor, relationship with other colleagues, working conditions, salary, status, security. He called these hygiene factors or extrinsic factors. By contrast, the factors that lead to extreme satisfaction at work are intrinsic, such as achievement, recognition, responsibility, the work itself, advancement, and growth. Hertzberg believed that the factors that cause dissatisfaction and that lead to satisfaction are, are not the opposite of each other. They address different human needs. Employers need to get the extrinsic factors right, otherwise employees will be dissatisfied. But you can't keep adding extrinsic factors and make people happy and motivated. To make them happy and motivated, you need to look at the intrinsic factors that really have to do with the content of the work itself. Achievement, recognition, responsibility, the work itself, advancement, and growth. 
Hertzberg said that if we could enrich jobs by increasing the intrinsic part of the job, that we'd have huge dividends in terms of human satisfaction and increased productivity. In short, both factors are important, but if you want to help your colleagues to perform at their highest levels, you've got to focus on the intrinsic motivators. In his research, one of the intrinsic rewards that was identified by Thomas and his colleagues was a sense of meaningfulness. And he said a sense of meaningfulness is the idea that you have a, a worthy task, that you're on a valuable mission, that your purpose is important uh, in the larger scheme of things. I think for people of faith, we're, we're very fortunate in this regard because we get to do God's work for God's glory. And it's hard to imagine a more worthy task, a more valuable mission that has a bigger impact on the larger scheme of things. There are many benefits to finding meaning. Research demonstrates that having purpose and meaning in your life increases the overall sense of well-being and, and life satisfaction. It improves mental and physical health and even resiliency. Having meaning in your life uh, enhances self-esteem, decreases the chances of depression, and is a key to being deeply happy. It can even be a key to life or death. Viktor Frankl uh, was a Jewish psychiatrist uh, practicing in Vienna when World War II broke out. He was captured by the Nazis and sent to a Nazi labor camp. Nazi labor camps were terrible places. I mean, people were literally worked to death. What Frankel observed was that the people who survived the labor camp tended to be those who still had a reason to live. They still had meaning in their lives. So he concluded that the primary motivational force in human beings was not power or sex, but the drive for meaning. After the war, he established logotherapy as his practice to help his clients find meaning in their lives. He published a book, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, that has had a very significant impact in the United States and throughout the world. It's not a happy book. It's about his experience at the uh, Nazi labor camp. Not a happy book, but a very important book. More recently, uh, a group of scholars uh, known as Boyle, Barnes, Buckman, and Bennett uh, did a study on older people and life expectancy. They, uh, they interviewed people and they asked them about uh, the meaning in their lives. They were able to categorize a group as low meaning and another group as, as having high meaning in their lives. Uh, and they, they controlled for conditions such as uh, uh, depression, disability, neurotic personality traits, uh, chronic medical conditions, or income. So the scholars stayed with these groups for five years. What they found was that the group that had low meaning had a higher mortality rate. More of them died. In fact, twice as many of them died as the high meaning group. The study suggests that finding meaning is a life or death issue, as Viktor Frankl found in the Nazi labor camps. Unfortunately, millions of Americans are not finding meaning in their lives. According to the Center for Disease Control, four out of 10 Americans have not found a satisfying life purpose. And nearly a quarter of all Americans do not have a strong sense of what would make their lives meaningful. This is really sad. I mean, this is really sad because meaning is so easy to find. There are sources of meaning all around us at home and at work. I have four that uh, I think are very simple and are available to everybody and they, they come from the teachings of Jesus. They are love people, help people, live ethically, and don't be too attached to material things. Now, I can't prove that there's a causal effect here, but it would make sense to me if there were, because I think if you love people, you want to help them. And if you're loving people and helping people, you want to treat them right. And if you're loving people, helping people, and treating them right, you're probably more focused on people and not too attached to material things, which gives you the opportunity to develop the life of the spirit. Most of us spend a big part of our lives at work. Uh, there are many sources of meaning at work, and I'd like to share nine sources of meaning that I think are always available to you no matter what's happening in your organization or in the world around you. And the reason is that they depend on you, your faith, your values, your attitude, all things that you control. First, your faith. It's good to remember that we are created to be productive. We learn in Genesis 2 that God put man in the Garden of Eden to Work it and take care of it. Um, work is part of our job description. And when we work, it can be an act of worship. We remember the letter of Paul to the Colossians where he said, 
whatever you do, work with all your heart as though you are serving the Lord, not human masters. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That can give our work a lot of meaning. Whatever we do, whomever we serve. Next, think about the impact of your organization. Think about all the children and teens and adults and seniors and families and communities that your organization touches. Jesus called us to serve, and that's what you and your colleagues are doing through the programs and products and services that you offer every day. You're having an impact on other people's lives. You're making a difference, and that should be an important source of meaning. Another source of meaning is your particular job or role within your organization. Your daily work is not just about your tasks. It's about the meaning you find in your tasks. And that meaning is pretty much up to you. There's a story that makes this point. It's a story about a monk who's traveling through Europe in the Middle Ages. He comes out into a clearing, onto a plain, and he sees in the distance uh, the foundation of a cathedral that's being built. And as he walks toward the cathedral, he sees there's a stone quarry where the stone is being removed to, to use in, in building the cathedral. And down in the quarry, there are, there are two men uh, who are shaping the stone. He walks up to the first man and he says, good morning, kind sir. Tell me, what are you doing? The man looks up at him and says, I'm chipping stone. And he says, thank you, good day. And he walks a little further and he comes to the second man. He says, good morning, kind sir. Tell me, what are you doing? And the man stops and he puts down his chisel and he looks up with a big smile and he says, I am building a cathedral. So obviously, they're both doing the same physical task. First man's not getting a lot of meaning out of it. Second man's getting a lot of meaning out of it. The point is, there's a lot of meaning around us. We just need to look up and see the cathedral. A few years back, I saw an advertisement on TV for the United States Air Force, and it had a similar message for me. So as the ad begins, um, a, a wife and children are kind of playing and, and, and enjoying themselves in front of a sofa in the living room. And, and then they turn to the camera and they freeze and it becomes a still photo. And then the camera backs up and you can see that photo is affixed to a wall or a panel of some kind. And then it backs up further and you can see, oh, that's the panel inside the cockpit of an airplane. And then it backs up further and you can see the pilot, the husband, the father flying the plane. And you know, he's not just flying a plane. He's protecting the family and the country that he loves. He's on a mission. If you think you just work in an organization, you're just chipping stone. If you think you're just doing administration or project management or HR or information technology or accounting, you're just flying the plane. You're missing the bigger meaning. What you're really doing is making a difference in the lives of other people, maybe even saving lives. That's the cathedral. That's the mission. And that should give you a lot of meaning every day. Next, focus on your contribution. Peter Drucker, a uh, founder of the Modern School of Management Studies, said that the key question that distinguishes an executive is the question, what can I contribute? Making a contribution is about making a difference. Day after day, year after year, ask yourself, what can I contribute? Can you think of a new program or product or service? Can you think of a way to cut costs while maintaining quality? Can you think of a way to improve your relationship with, with customers in a way that will enable you to serve them better? Can you look at a problem that's out there in the distance you might be able to solve before it becomes a really big problem? Or maybe there's a problem that's been around for a long time that nobody's paid attention to, but you can solve it. Step back and look at the entire organization and all the customers you serve and see if there's a way that you can make a contribution. When you do, you will make a difference, and that will be an important source of meaning for you. One note here. Sometimes the contribution you make won't solve the whole problem, but it's still worth taking a step in that direction. And the story that comes to mind for me is the story of the boy and the starfish on the beach. The story is that thousands of starfish washed up on the beach where they started to, to dry out and die. Well, a boy went down to the beach and he started tossing the starfish back into the water, one by one. Now, there was a passerby in the distance. He watched for a while, and then he came down to the boy and he said, why bother? There are too many of them. You can't make a difference. Made a difference in the life of that one, the boy said, as he tossed another one back into the water. Sometimes you can't solve the whole problem, but you can still make a meaningful difference. Next, 
focus on helping your colleagues. No matter where they are in the organizational chart, maybe they look like they're subordinates or peers or superiors, wherever they are in the chart, your colleagues need help. If you pay attention, you can figure out ways to help them. One of the things you can always do is mentor colleagues. Even if you've only been with the organization for a few months, you already know more than a person does on their first day on the job. And you can mentor them about the mission and values of the organization. Mentoring others can be a wonderful source of meaning for you. Next, focus on pitching in to get the work done. Yes, we are social beings and it's hard to ignore the gossip and the office politics, but the fact is your job is not about whether you're on the inside track or the outside track or nowhere near the track. Um, your job is not about those knowing glances across the conference room table or the whispering at the water cooler about you know what. Your job is about fulfilling the mission of your organization and serving your customers. That's where the meaning is. The meaning's not in the rumor mill. The meaning's in the work. Next, always do what's right. Yeah, the world of work can change. I mean, it can change because there's new leadership. It can change because there's a rise of a competitor. It can change because there's a new government regulation. But even as the world of work changes, that should not change who you are or what you know to be right and good and true. You need to have core values, and you need to live those values. If you do, you won't get lost. Even as the world becomes a pretty foggy and unpredictable place, you will know who you are and how you want to live. And that will continue to be an important source of meaning for you. Next, always do your best. That should be what defines you. I have a question that I like to ask people, which is, if you aren't giving the world your best, what world are you saving it for? This is the work you're given. These are the people who need your programs, products, or services. Why would you hold back? Each of us every day should give our best and sense the tremendous personal meaning that that can give us. Finally, be ambitious, but be ambitious for your organization, not for yourself. Think about where you'd like your organization to be a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. What can you do to help your organization uh, to reach that new ambitious level? What kind of legacy do you want to, to leave? Working toward a legacy can be tremendously meaningful. So those are nine sources of meaning at work that should always be available to you because they're about your faith, your values, and your attitude. Because meaning is so important, servant leaders are meaning makers for their colleagues. They help their colleagues to understand the importance of the organization's work. They help th their colleagues understand the meaning of their role, their part of that work. And wherever possible, they redesign the work to make it more meaningful. Cheryl Batchelder is a Christian servant leader who has helped others to find meaning in their work. Cheryl is the CEO of Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen. In her book, Dare to Serve, she explains how she applied servant leadership principles to turn around that restaurant chain. When Cheryl assumed leadership of Popeyes, the company had been declining for many years. Six years later, the average restaurant sales was up 25%. The market share had increased from 14 to 21%. The profitability of the Popeye stores was up 40% in real dollars, and the stock price was up 450%. So Cheryl dared to serve and her organization grew. She gives God the credit. In the dedication to her book, she says, all glory be to God the Father, for he sent his son who dared to serve all of us. While Cheryl took many steps to improve the performance of the company, one of the things she did was to invite the leaders of the company to develop their own personal purpose to give their work meaning. She believes that leaders need to bring a purpose and meaning to the work because that's fundamental to creating a high performance organization. Cheryl pointed out that when people believe that their work matters, they arrive early and they stay late. They come up with creative solutions to problems. They build their skills. Uh, they support the work of the team. They stay on the job longer. They have higher levels of energy, commitment to the organization, and performance. Popeyes conducted a workshop to help their leaders to identify their personal purpose. Then they connected the personal purpose with the Popeyes purpose 
which is to inspire servant leaders to achieve superior results. Team members are then encouraged to put their personal purpose into action because that results in sustained superior performance. People perform better when they have a desire to serve and they are intrinsically motivated because their work is meaningful. That was the conclusion of research done by Adam Grant, a uh, professor of management at the Wharton School. Grant studied the impact of pro-social motivation when combined with intrinsic motivation. Now, pro-social motivation is the desire to help others and make the world better. And of course, intrinsic motivation has to do with personal growth and meaning. He said that when those are combined, employees displayed higher levels of persistence, performance, and productivity, which are all good things. This does not surprise Christian servant leaders. They know that when people respond to the call of Jesus to serve, they find God's work to be meaningful, and they are able to perform at very high levels. In summary, servant leaders move beyond theory X and extrinsic motivation and focus on theory Y and intrinsic motivation. They know that the highest levels of performance result from intrinsic motivation. Meaning is an intrinsic motivator, and there are many sources of meaning at work. Because meaning is so important, servant leaders become meaning makers, helping their colleagues to build their cathedrals. As people of faith, we are blessed because we know that we have the opportunity to do God's work for God's glory. And nothing could be more meaningful than that. I'd be happy to have uh, questions. Yes. Dr. Keith, uh, you had said that extrinsic re rewards can kill intrinsic motivation in workers and in people. Uh, from your experience, has, is it possible to reverse that process where uh, intrinsic motivation has been kind of wiped out by extrinsic? Is it possible to restore a uh, servant leader back to uh, being motivated intrinsically? Oh, I, I think it's possible, but the studies that I've seen, uh, it doesn't happen right away. Um, you know, where they actually, for example, they'll, they'll say, uh, would you play with this, this game like a Rubik's Cube or something? And they say, oh, by the way, we got a budget, now we can pay you. And they're, oh, happy, now I'm doing that. They say, oh, we lost our budget, we can't pay you anymore. And they won't go back to doing it anymore uh, it, immediately. So, so my hope and answer to your question is in some of these areas over time, you could change the context, draw people back into something they originally enjoyed doing, and, and try to reset the context so they don't remember that, that it was made into work. I had that question, my wife and I have a dialogue about this because of the programs that reward children for reading. You know, it, literally, if you read the book, you get a prize. And, and the question is, are they gonna continue to read when there are no more prizes? And uh, we got into a good discussion of that because it's possible that if there are other things, like doing it with your family or you know doing it with others that you could change the context um, but it's it's a tricky thing uh, extrinsic rewards tend to kill intrinsic motivation how about uh, another question how would you go about moving somebody who is extrinsically motivated to someone who is more intrinsically motivated i think it's very hard to do uh, because the whole mindset is i'm only going to do it if i get a reward and so the only thing that I know, the only thing that has worked for me to some degree is just personal example. Um, you don't do it for a reward and you look for people who are also willing to not do it for reward and you hope that gradually that will catch on. Just emphasize the meaning of the work or the meaning of the activity and just, just try to build that. But I don't think it's easy. People really do get conditioned to expect that the whole world is about rewards or threats of punishment. And it's hard to bring them back to the intrinsic. Anyone else, another question? 
Um, you, you mentioned some positive aspects of the ex extrinsic motivations. What are some ways you can tie together extrinsic motivations with, um, with intrinsic? You know, I like what Hertzberg said. Um, and actually, he didn't call the extrinsic motivators motivators. He, he called them extrinsic factors that you have to take care of. Um, it's realistic. I mean, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to earn money. We care about our working conditions, our relationships, all of that. So he includes that as part of the model. So I think that's very realistic. But he says you can only go so far. So it's part of the total picture, but you're not going to go much further unless you focus on the intrinsic. That's where you lift off and really get your high performance. So I recommend Hertzberg. I think basically he got it right that you can combine them. But he didn't really look at the extrinsic factors as motivators. They're just things you need to take care of so people are not dissatisfied. So that, I would use that as a model. How about another question? Uh, in your example about the stone cutters, the one that was just chipping stone and the other that was building a cathedral, how do we go about changing the mindset of the stone chipper to the one building a cathedral? As a servant leader, how do we go about changing that mindset? I think that's, when I talk about servant leaders are meaning makers, I think you just have to keep pointing it out. You have to talk to people about what is the, the big picture, what kind of impact are we having on other people. Um, often, you, you, some, some organizations, you will actually bring in people who are benefited by the work of the organization, have them tell their story. You're making a difference in my life, and this is how. So I mean, you, you really have to focus on that and, and share your ideas directly, and then see if you can connect people with the actual impact. When, when Hertzberg talked about redesigning work to make it more meaningful, that's part of what he had in mind was connecting people more with the actual impact and the human beings that are benefiting. So it takes a good deal of effort, um, but it's really worth doing.